so yeah i'll i'll be talking about what we are doing in the uh, in in uh, what kind of research we are doing in in uh, related to memories uh, to be more precise uh, semiconductor memory uh, technology so you know uh, this would be the outline of my talk brief motivation then i'll try to cover a couple of specific examples based on how much time we have today so uh, you know the basic motivation for this kind of effort lies in the sort of environment uh, that we are living in or that we are aiming to build around ourselves any sector that you take whether it is iot smart cities social media uh, defense and security digitization of governments anything that you take is uh, you know predominantly takes us in the direction of extreme data or extreme information generation so that is the more uh, conventional motivation behind even looking into memory or storage uh, or uh, memory related aspects and uh, you know if if trends are to be uh, taken at face value there are units known as uh, new units uh, known as zeta bytes or 10 raised to 21 uh, so we are just talking about huge uh, amount of data so you know things like 62000 billion uh, gigabytes so not 62 gb or 62000 gb but 62000 billion gb so uh, so definitely the sheer quantum of information is one thing that uh, pushes us to ask uh, this question that what are we doing with the methods and the means uh, to store uh, all this information around us like uh, it, it takes us to more Uh, scientific uh, or fundamental questions that what kind of platforms or mechanisms we even have to hold this information because at some point it does become uh, physical uh, in the real world or in the electronic or the uh, semiconductor world uh, now uh, the other interesting aspect what has been happening more recently is something that goes beyond just uh, you know the storage uh, beyond just one and zero storage and uh, if we look at some of the uh, present day applications that everyone is talking about whether you refer to uh, ml ai uh, even the distinguished speaker before me uh, mentioned things like classification and and so on uh, this this chart shows you uh, you know a breakdown it's it's, it's from 2017 uh, it it shows you a dissipation map of what would happen if you run uh, a deep network if you try to dissect it Uh, what you would see here is that about uh, 22% of the dissipation is directly from the weights and about 43 from the output feature maps 25% from the input feature maps and so all this amounts up to almost 90% and surprisingly just 10% from uh, computation so uh, the motivation uh, the the understanding of uh, or how digital systems or computational systems have evolved over the years uh primary emphasis on getting was was on getting the compute power uh, in place on on scaling the transistors or uh, getting the compute as efficient as possible uh, now that is something which needs uh, a revisit or an inspection because the kind of application domain with ml ai or big data kind of computing that we are walking into uh, it it so happens that when you do a breakdown of of those or when you dissect or look deeper into those applications it turns out that memory starts taking a more center stage all memory related actions so this is another motivation why we are looking at these things which is just beyond the simple numbers of storage that how much more you need to store now let us look at one more trend you know the outcome of conventional von neumann computing uh, which isolates uh, the processing and storage blocks separately so these are some estimates which show you uh, that if uh, you know just to give a sense that if a typical add operation was normalized the dissipation for an add, add operation in compute was normalized to 1x uh, the energy that you dissipate to uh, send data off your ex or your main memory or fetch it back that's almost like 3000x so uh, you can yourself uh, you know take a call that which one if i want to design optimized systems or really efficient systems uh, what i need to focus on should i focus more uh, on the optimization of compute or really how uh, data is managed how data is handled how it is fetched and, and so again uh, what i am trying to underline here is that there are multiple motivations which uh, push us in the direction of really thinking deeply about memory uh, so far it has been dealt with just one lens that is like storing ones and zeros and here we are making a case of going beyond that motivation so uh, another interesting thing that we also looked into our research is bio inspired uh, computing or uh, a niche area of bio inspired computing that we define as neuromorphic computing or neuromorphic systems and again the inspiration here comes from uh, the little the very little things that we know about uh, processing uh, in in mammal brains 
and uh, if if i were to you know just uh, abstract the key message given the time constraint and that is uh, from the little that we do understand about processing uh, in in mammal brains or so, so the very limited aspects of mammal brains is that again the uh, pipeline of compute over there is such that the memory and processing uh, or the memory and compute are not isolated they uh, do get merged at places so in your conventional von neumann architecture you would have uh, very clearly defined instances where uh, the cpus or the logic units would do the math and the memory blocks would store the results or would store the operands and so on uh, but uh, this is where uh, in in nature or in more efficient computational system the lines uh, get blurred so you can think of it if you have uh, you know a giga uh, a gigabits or a gigabytes worth of memory and every small memory block starts to compute or do some math for you and you are not just depending on your cpu uh, then it just becomes massively parallel and even though if the memory cells or the memory blocks they do a very simple operation like an addition operation or 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 a very a uh, straightforward compute not any fancy uh, non linear compute still the power that it would give to the entire system would be just uh, enormous so so uh, now the good thing is that uh, it's not just in academia that these ideas are being pushed around the industry is taking uh, cognizance and uh, it's uh, the even even better thing is that things are actually being fabricated in in hardware with with some of these uh, paradigms research paradigms that uh, i'm going to talk about and you know there are a lot of cases whether you talk about uh, you know intel ibm or uh, nvidia where custom uh, ml ai hardware with a very strong focus on how memory is behaving inside these uh, hardware uh, systems is is coming into light and and that is that is a good case and that makes the area very active and very interesting to Uh, be working into at the moment so uh, you know i i'd like to make this comment that memory technology is no hype and in fact i feel it's one of the uh, real manifested science fictions or uh, targets that uh, we do envision for very futuristic uh, engineered objects so some of the things or man made marvels that we cherish are like uh, you know structures like these where we say that you're packing 160 floors uh, in a length of 800 meters uh, now let's look at this these are 128 floors packed very neatly uh, in a dimension less than 100 microns so and 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 this is a reality this this exists in in your hands if you are working with a ssd uh, which is uh, any solid state drive which is uh, reaching the capacity of hundreds of gbs or or even 1 tb and upward so these are these are these uh, extreme uh, extremely engineered 3d integrated uh, ics or or semiconductor chips are are not a fancy they are still evolving or going through the phase of maturity while we speak about logic and transistors but in memory uh, they do exist even as of today uh, you know the uh, potkim stairs in ukraine and there you go again with uh, nano um, vertical flash memory cells where you have very finely uh, graded uh, staircases making connections taking care of all parasitics and where you are extremely finally or in a controlled way manipulating electrons in each of these uh, 128 floors so so this is something which is real so that that gives us uh, more uh, you know encouragement and hope to use these structures or use these devices for applications which are beyond just one and zero storage so that is one of the research vision that we follow that you know memory by far has been dumb people just use it to store ones and zeros let's say if we can take it uh, beyond so Uh, in our group at iit delhi we have been exploring several different materials and depending on the underlying material the operational physics of uh, the storage mechanism changes and uh, you know we come up with different flavors when you change the material uh, the switching action changes so uh, different physical phenomena uh, get involved there are uh, structures where we have redox reactions that lead to ones and zeros uh, there are structures where we have uh, you know uh, phase change mechanisms where you are going between amorphous and crystalline phases there are uh, mechanisms where we are exploiting uh, magneto resistive properties or we are playing with the vacancies and defects so in all these emerging memory devices as we change the material the underlying switching physics uh, changes and uh, interestingly what it leads to uh, it gives you many new properties many new characteristics to play around with and uh, that is what Uh, we try to exploit to build new applications now 
the traditional uh, way for the industry has been to just get a clean one and zero and stop at there. Uh, but uh, and to ignore or to mask all the non-linearities or the non-idealities um, as as you know uh, variations or variability. But uh, what we do is we go into that scrap zone and we pick up those properties which are known uh, to be a nuisance or a problem in the conventional industry, and we try to say can we uh, put them to some use? And that is one fundamental uh, you know direction of uh, how we look at things. So in our group, uh, you know, uh, the different memory applications that we have been uh, investigating uh, from the uh, with respect to the next generation memory devices are obviously on one side, they are the conventional applications which are related to uh, pure storage. And on the other side that I like to call as unconventional applications, uh, the first set of applications relate to intelligence or uh, that is again more compute centric applications. So these can go for building neuromorphic systems, uh, we have demonstrated some machine learning realizations, uh, energy efficient uh, realizations for CNNs, BNNs, um, restricted, restricted Boltzmann machines, uh, in memory computing or logic in memory. Um, and then we have certain applications which are more uh, hybrid circuits, hybrid CMOS and VM circuits. And uh, what we do here are applications like uh, content addressable memory, non volatile SRAM. Uh, and more recently, even some interesting use cases on security. So uh, hardware security or uh, cyber physical security, where we are developing security primitives such as PUFs, uh, physically unclonable functions, or uh, random number generators or pseudo random number generators. So uh, now what is the approach that we follow in all of this is we try to follow uh, a structured backbone. Uh, we start with materials or devices, uh, try to extract their electrical uh, behavior, Go further modeling it in different ways, whether it is empirical, uh, compact, or uh, behavioral modeling, uh, whatever the use case is. Then we start building circuits with those models. Uh, those circuits very soon they graduate to architectures, and that is where we can start benchmarking applications on them. And the new applications, uh, three new applications that we do beyond storage are compute sense and security. And finally, we put these things to the benchmarking test against conventional solutions. So it's it's a bi-directional approach, you know, from any of these circles, some feedback can trickle in uh, to some another circle. So at times what we have, what happens is that uh, we have an application and the target is to find the right uh, kind of uh, device or the right kind of circuit which optimizes that application. And uh, many times it happens is that we have a device in hand or properties of a device which are very unique and we need to find an application to which it can be mapped. So, so this is a very interesting loop, and then this makes the you know research non-monotonous, and because because we get a chance to uh, keep going between uh, different different layers uh, of of this optimization. So, uh, I'll just take one uh, you know one or two quick specific cases. So, when we build these uh, neuromorphic systems, one of the key elements that uh, we try to emulate is the biological synapse and. Uh, at a very abstract level, if you look at the biological synapse, it's uh, we consider it or we oversimplify it to be uh, a, a programmable resistor. Uh, you know, a, a, a programmable uh, resistor sitting between two neurons, meaning how two neurons communicate. If if the synapse is extremely uh, potentiated, it it lets the signals go through. It it augments the signals that go through between two neurons. If it is depressed. Uh, it would try to block those signals. So in pure electrical terms, we look at it as uh, a programmable non-volatile resistor. And that's where uh, the synergy with some of these uh, resistive memory devices or emerging memory devices start because uh, electronically we can uh, manipulate their resistance states and their conductance states. So some of the characteristic problems that one needs to solve uh, when we are trying to build these uh, spiking uh, brain-like systems is to see that uh, you know, some specific questions that we try to answer is that how many uh, different levels or how many different weights uh, even exist uh, between uh, the two extreme states. Uh, and then uh, in, in, electro in, in, in device technology, what happens is there is some asymmetry depending on the physical mechanism involved. When you go from a low conductance to high conductance, in some cases it may be gradual, it may be a step function. Uh, it may be an abrupt function, and in the other cases, it may be completely different. Uh, so we try to see how to solve those problems and map it to biological uh, learning rules. Uh, the other aspect is that uh, the neurons uh, 
uh, in uh, mammalian brains, the action potential uh, by far we consider it to be identical. And uh, so one challenge here is to get identical signals to be able to manipulate this device. So, yeah, I think that is uh, just the second case quickly that I'd like to cover is that, you know, uh, in the sem uh, semiconductor industry, uh, as we scale, as we go towards more nano technologies, uh, there is the huge problem of process variability or device variability and the devices start showing non ideal behavior. And that is where that is considered as a problem by the industry. Uh, these distributions that you see or these broken curves that you see, the industry wants them to be ideal. Uh, but we step into uh, these uh, scrap zones and we try to exploit them uh, for the uh, different applications because there are applications which would benefit from these kind of distributions, whether it is, uh, you know, randomizing a weight matrix in a neural network or it is uh, getting a source of noise or, or if you're trying to get a nonlinear mathematics done, uh, then again, these kind of uh, weird or unwanted characteristics would be of uh, use. So this is a very interesting direction where we put to use all the properties which were disliked by the conventional industry. So, uh, so with that, I'd like to conclude and, you know, I think it's as mentioned, it's a great time to be in this field because we are going beyond storing just ones and zeros. Uh, deterministic behavior of the electronic devices was always being used and it is always desired, but what we are vouching for is to use probabilistic behavior, non-ideal behavior, or even stochastic behavior, meaning all the misbehavior of the devices is what we are uh, pitching to use. And that is a significant change from the norm because a lot of resources are left, uh, are spent actually to make the devices behave in a deterministic way rather than a indeterministic way. So overall playground is, you know, uh, it's multidimensional. You can optimize some things at the level of circuits, something at the level of architectures, all of these go hand in hand. And uh, memory can now be used for storage computing sense secure and with that i'd like to end i'd like to thank uh, you know the students research funding uh, and the academy again for uh, giving me this opportunity thank you this is a question from professor jayam saritra uh, the question is in the new memories reads and writes are highly dissimilar with regard to their execution overheads so do you expect that existing applications would have to be rewritten from scratch to leverage the new platforms? Thank you, Professor Jayanth. I think that is a very interesting question. And indeed, uh, that is a right observation. That is a correct observation that uh, in many of these devices, the write behavior and the read behavior is not uh, symmetric. It's, it's not uh, identical. Uh, now, uh, yes, uh, if these devices are to be plugged as it is into uh, a present day system, uh, then you need to account for a translational overhead, like in the firmware or in the interfaces that go between these new technologies and a present day system. Uh, you would need to build some overhead which uh, tries to mask these asymmetries from the user. Okay, so that is one way of looking at it. If you are trying to use these technologies in an existing system, then you would have to spend some overhead to mask uh, the asymmetries. However, if you have the freedom to, uh, you know, completely design a new system, completely design a new computer and not be compatible with uh, an older system, then uh, you, may, you may not have the need to write uh, these masking uh, firmwares or softwares and you can rather exploit these uh, read write asymmetries to your own application or to your own uh, advantage. So, so there are uh, there are both ways to look at it depending on where exactly you want to use it and in what kind of system you want to put it. So. Thanks, Manan. There is another question from Professor Rene Burgess. What about memory storage using DNA molecules? So, uh, Professor Rene, that is a very uh, nice remark, and uh, I would say. Uh, in the electronic storage community, uh, that is seen as a, you know, an ideal goal because again, uh, the amount of data that can be stored uh, in, DNA, in, you know, in a, let's say, in, in the same uh, spatial constraints in a DNA strand would be uh, much higher, and also the temporal reliability uh, over how many years it can be preserved uh, would also 
so be much higher so from a density or capacity point of view it is definitely something which is uh, of interest uh, there are a lot of research activities i think in fact also some research groups in microsoft who are trying to uh, exploit dna for uh, storage uh, the challenge lies in uh, making these systems communicate with the electronic uh, systems at at the right speeds at which the speeds at which you would want to use your own uh, hard disk or your pen drive uh, challenge lies there because uh, we cannot directly communicate in a fluid electronic way uh, with uh, with all the biochemical aspects uh, of of the dna uh, based uh, system so okay uh, there is a question from watsala nema can technologies like tiny ml be leveraged in biomedical use cases using neuromorphic computing uh, so can technologies like tiny ml so uh, definitely i think tiny ml is is uh, as far as i understand it's it's for it's optimized uh, for the edge for low resource uh, situations and neuromorphic also to a great extent one of the motivations for neuromorphic is neuromorphic uh, design is to be um, resource friendly for com computing on the edge so uh, if 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 that is your question that can both be used for bio applications then uh, yes they they are suitable for edge bio applications okay and madam there is another question which relates to material science aspects of this this is by professor baskaran question is when you use phase change materials how do you gain switching speeds crystallization of amorphous or even nano materials involve reorganization of lots of atoms so thank you professor baskaran that is a very good question so i'll uh, first give you an idea of the speeds that we are talking about in these devices so uh, we are talking of the order of few tens of nanoseconds so we try to switch Uh, these devices between amorphous and crystalline phases say by applying electrical stimuli which is uh, 10 to 50 nanoseconds uh, and so and we use uh, high voltage uh, electrical pulses so uh, i think uh, the material engineering the calcogenide material engineering is very important uh, to get the switching speeds right uh, we use uh, you know alloys like gst in 2 to 5 stoichiometry uh, gt um in xy stoichiometry and so on so material engineering uh, and volume confinement uh, between so these these uh, phase change materials are uh, we try to confine them uh, in a small 3d volume between two uh, metallic electrodes so that again helps and then there is a i think i can go back to the slide uh, just to make it more easy so uh, yeah so if you see the device here so this is the phase change device uh, and you know these uh, this calcogenide switching layer is about 50 nanometers thick and the dimension diameter of this pillar this heater plug uh, which lead which this leads to joule heating in this region and so you have melting uh, of of this calcogenide material and when this melting happens uh, depending on how you quench it or how fast you cool it down you would either end up with an amorphous or a crystalline phase in this region so uh, these dimensions uh, aspect ratios and the volume confinement of this phase change material they are uh, done on purpose in such a way that you get the fast nanosecond switching speeds uh, then again what i'd like to point out is we are not trying to change the phase of the entire uh, full sheet uh, that would be more uh, time consuming uh, for sure as as you pointed out so Yeah, yeah. Um, Manan, let me make one short comment in the last minute available. Uh, this relates to Baskaran's question. So these phase change materials are also called as bond change materials. They exhibit very different type of bonding in their amorphous phase and in crystalline phase. And in fact, the bonding in the crystalline phase is less understood. It has been recently termed as what is known as metavalent bonding, which is different from metallic covalent or ionic type bonding, and that is what makes them very special to allow this type of very quick transformation, at least in the nano domains, from crystal to uh, amorphous phase. In fact, my group is involved in understanding that bonding in the recent year, so I'll be happy to interact with you more on that later. 
So uh, there are no other questions, but uh, uh, there were quite a few good questions so far. And I request all of you to join me in thanking Manan Suri for a very interesting, stimulating talk.